So the task I was going to talk about was about the, the pre-weaning welfare of piglets. And my name is Lene U. Petersen. I'm from Aarhus University. And I've been uh, uh, doing quite a lot of studies on pig welfare, amongst other, how to improve the welfare of the sound piglets during uh, farrowing and lactation periods. <coughs> I've chosen to focus on, on three issues that, that I find particular challenges for the welfare of the suckling pigs, which are the mortality, quite high mortality in a seen in, in many countries, and also poor growth in the low birth weight piglets, the problem of surplus piglets in large litters, and limitation of space and suitable enrichment materials in the farm pin. It is quite uh, well known that uh, piglets with a low birth weight are particularly at risk of dying during the first days of life. And this uh, problem has always been there, but due to the uh, genetic selection for the large litter sites that are ongoing in many countries, we see an increasing number of piglets with a low uh, birth weight. And as you can see on the figure to the right, uh, that shows uh, the relationship between the litter size and here the birth weight of the piglets. You can see that as litter size go up, birth weights go down, and the same goes for, for the weaning weight. And in addition, we know that when pigs have a low weaning weight, they also will grow, grow uh, slower to slaughter. So you could say overall that the low uh, birth weight have long-term consequences for the piglets uh, bigger and, and gross. One major problem with the low birth weight piglet is that small pigs are born with fewer energy reserves and therefore their ability to thermoregulate at birth, at birth is uh, quite low. So um, what I show here is that pigs, when pigs experience uh, are, are born, um, you could see the number of hours uh, on the x-axis and the te body temperature of the pigs at birth. You see here that they experience a quite marked drop in body temperature right after birth. It can drop several degrees Celsius within like the first 10 or 20 minutes after birth. The normal pattern would be like you see on the, the yellow graph where they drop down uh, quite a lot and then recover while some will drop even more dramatically down and have difficulties in recovering and getting back into normal body temperature. And we know here that the, there's a quite a large difference in this uh, size of this drop depending on the size of uh, this side of the piglets. So you can see here examples with pigs weighing 800 grams compared to weighing 1600 grams at birth, that the, this uh, average drop in body temperature differ about 1.7 degrees Celsius um, within the first two hours of birth. And as, as I said, of course, not all pigs die from this drop. Some does, uh, typically the smaller ones, and uh, some recover. But we know that even those that recover from this drop in body temperature, when they have experienced this drop, they will still be more uh, prone to die from other causes, such as what, what we normally see as starvation or piglets being crossed, or even also piglets dying later on during the suckling period due to various diseases. There we see in studies that that still this drop in, in body temperature is a high risk factor also for, for dying due to these other causes. And therefore it's very important to avoid a period of, of uh, short hypothermia right after birth. And so to keep the piglet warm after birth, um, pens are typically equipped with some uh, heated area for the pigs with a heat lamp or a heated floor area that it's out of reach of the sow. But we know that right at birth, the, the, where the heat loss is very critical, the pigs also have an innate motivation to stay close to the sow's order, as you can see on this photo. And, and therefore, at that period, this creep heating or heated area away from the sow doesn't really help uh, this initial drop in body temperature. <coughs> we have uh, investigated how different uh, 
uh, thermal sources can prevent the large drop in body temperature after birth. And that is illustrated on this figure here, again, where we have followed the body temperature of, of the newborn piglets for the first two hours, and then added different thermal, uh, 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 thermal sources to prevent the drop. So you can see the upper curves uh, where the drop is lowest, is lowest where the thermal sources uh, is best. And the, the upper curve is actually a, a deep straw bedding which prevent uh, the drop the very best. It shortly followed by a radiant heater from above down on a concrete or slatted floor. And the reason that this uh, needs are the, or helps are the, the best is likely that the pig um, loses a lot of heat from evaporation because the still wet from the birth fluid and therefore when they get the heat from either the, the straw uh, that dries them up or a radiant heater that also helps drive them up, this helps the bed best. Also floor heating uh, in form of for example a radiant plate or just a normal water based floor heat also prevents the drop compared to the two uh, lower curves which is a controlled situation without any thermal heats. So we could say that deep straw and radiant heat protects against uh, this hypothermia just after birth. Uh, the, these are the best sources to, to, to keep this in place. But then um, after a few days, uh, the heated creep area is also a good help. Um, we know uh, that the piglets will start to use the creep area, not the first day, as you see here on this graph. Uh, on day one, the, the use of the creep area is very low, but it increases quite a lot on day two and three, and then are more or less stable throughout. And here we compare two different heat sources, a normal um, light-based heat bowl with a radiant heat uh, plate in the top of the creep area. You can see when we had the, the radiant heater, which is the red column, then the piglets were using uh, the creep area much more than when they had the normal heat ball because uh, the, the heat distribution with a radiant heater is much more even and, and spread over a larger surface so it's easier for the piglets to find into the creep and feel the heat from, from the radiant heater. So it, uh, the, the creep area, heated area can protect against cold but not until the first one or two days after this. <clears throat> so another consequence of breeding for the large litter size is that sows give birth to more pigs than their number of functional teats. And this creates a situation um, where we see, for example, in, in Denmark now we have 17 to 18 live-born piglets in the litter and the sow only had 14, 15 uh, functional teats and even less when they grow older. So we will typically have uh, four or five surplus piglets in every litter. And how, what is actually happening in that situation? And we know that um, when as soon as there are more pigs than, than teeth, uh, this is kind of incompatible, you could say, with the sow's nursing pattern, uh, which is developed in a way where pigs defend ownership to a preferred teeth and the sow uh, lie down milk synchronously every hour for a very short period of 20 to 30 seconds. So this demand that each pig have uh, their preferred teeth in the mouth uh, when milk let down is present in order for them to get the milk. So as soon as there are more pigs than, than, than teeth, we see a situation that creates um, a high competition over the peats, over the teeth. Um, and this increases, um, we have seen in studies that, that uh, in this situation we'll see uh, increased number of teeth fights during milk let down, which is uh, seen typical as facial lesion as shown on the photo to the right. Um, and also, uh, which is also detrimental for the, for the pigs, that is that when they fight for teeth when milk let down is occurring, 
they loses the milk, so they have an unsuccessful suckling. And we also see that in some cases, if teeth fight are too much, sows will disrupt uh, the milk let down and, and completely abolish the, the, the nursing. And that affects not only the pigs without a teeth, but also those that actually had a, a stable teeth, the defended. So to avoid this situation, the owner, um, the producers need to take some caution here. And what have been done uh, now in, in recent years is to make uh, nurse sows uh, to care for the surplus piglets. Uh, however, this is not also done without consequences for the welfare of, of both the sows and piglets. Uh, at Aarhus University, we did a, a, a large survey on farm on on the welfare of both sows and piglets in in nurse uh, sows, and what was seen here was that there was increased risk of uh, leg injuries uh, in the piglets, and we saw more dirty pigs in in uh, pigs involved in in um, or yeah involved in uh, this formation of nurse sows and being fostered on. And for the sow, we saw increased um, order lesions uh, on, on nurse sows compared to not nurse sows. Also, we have looked further into the behavioral responses of pigs and uh, piglets during nurse sows. And what we see here is that the, in average, um, that the sows will not let down the milk in average four, before four to five hours after the new piglets have been introduced so there is a period of of uh, starvation for the piglets and also we saw that even some uh, sows it was not many but still some sows completely um, avoid to accept the, the newborn piglets and the nurse sows uh, process had to be redone because the sow would, would not let down milk for the piglets and what was seen was also that the, even though the piglets was accepted, they still had to form a new uh, teeth order, and that uh, is not done without teeth fights. So we saw more teeth fight in the in the fostered piglets, and also a reduced uh, growth uh, in the fostered uh, piglets compared to uh, their own growth compa uh, com potential. See. So what was done is that um, the use of nurse house is necessary when there are more piglets than, uh, than teens. And if, and if it cannot be, be handled by, by merely cross-fostering between litters, but um, doing this still affects the, the, the welfare of both sows and piglets. There are also other alternatives uh, that are used uh, around in different countries. One of them is to use the so-called rescue deck. And here, um, surplus piglets are taken away from, from their mother out of the farrowing pen and moved into a, a rescue deck where they are fed entirely on milk replacer. And, and this can be done. The piglets will survive. And if the milk, um, milk quality is, is very high, they also grow good. But what is seen is a lot of abnormal, abnormal behavior in form of, for example, belly nursing. And also in most systems, uh, reduced growth have been observed, uh, likely because the milk uh, that is offered has, do not have the same quality as the sour milk. In addition, you could say that doing this is um, it, uh, partly an early weaning of the pig from the sow, at least in terms of uh, getting access to the mother. And it's, uh, uh, it's, it's not be recommended because it develops a lot of behavior problems that may um, follow them also after the weaning from the milk. And also I know in some uh, countries it's not allowed as, as a process to do. What can then be done instead is to um, still keep the sow with with the large litter, so let her stay with maybe not all her piglets, but at least more piglets than, than she has teeth for, and then supplement within the farrowing pen with a milk uh, replacer, which can be seen on the photo with the red uh, milking system. That is an automatic uh, milking system where 
milk is mixed outside every day and provided continuously through milking cups so the piglets can always uh, access uh, the supplemental milk. And um, we have started this system and, um, and actually um, um, had, had the fear that we would see that some piglets would completely leave the sow and then drink from the milk cup while the others could then um, uh, suckle the sow. But that was not what happened. Um, we did see that it improved survival of the piglets, but we saw also that actually all pigs for every milklet down, they tried to get access to the sow milk. They were still fighting over the milk, some were losing. Um, and after then, when the milk uh, let down had been occurring, then uh, some piglets were going to get more milk from the milk replacer. Um, and it was not only the small piglets, but in to a large extent also those piglets that got lots of milk at the sow, they supplemented at the milk replacer and they grow very big, whereas others were just getting smaller and smaller. So what we saw was again more teeth fight at the udder and more facial lesion, so that problem was not solved by this system. And also we saw that the weaning weight in errors were reduced um, compared to, for example, if, if the litter size were lower. So the last litter also creates problems in terms of space in the, in the farrowing crate. The directive says <laughs> that they must have sufficient space to be able to suckle without difficult. And <clears throat> the, the two pictures I show here is a clear example that this is not always the case. <laughs> Uh, some farrowing pins are made with a very narrow um, space between the sow, udder, and the wall at one side, but plenty of space to the other side. And to the other side, and here there are problems getting access to the milk. Also, the other thing that is stated in the directive is that part of the total floor, sufficient to allow the animals to rest together at the same time, must be solid or covered with a mat or be littered with a, with a straw bedding. And that is possible in, in some type of pens where there are plenty of uh, solid floor, but in other type of, of farrowing pens, uh, for example, the first and third uh, photo here, where there is a lot of solid, uh, flatted floor, there need to be sufficient solid floor in, for example, a creep area for the piglets, where they can lie all of them together at the same time. And in order to be able to assess this, it's important to know uh, the space that uh, piglets take up at uh, different uh, periods or ages during the suckling period. And this has been measured in, <coughs> in a Danish study some years ago, uh, where um, you can see what, what uh, space 10 piglets take up when they're four weeks or 12 pigs take up at four weeks when they have to lie all of them together uh, in different positions, for example, sternal line or partly lateral line or lateral line. So you can see here if around what I have circled uh, with the red circle, that uh, if we say that 12, 12 piglets will be present at four weeks of age, they should be able to lie partly lateral line at the same time, which is the preferred position for this eight a pig, then there should be at least 1.3 square meter with solid floor um, positioned away from the sow where they can lie together at the same time. Also, if we should assess um, if they have sufficient space to struggle without difficulties, it's important to know the length of the piglet so that we can see what is the length from the sow's order to the wall when she lies down, for example, in a crate as on the photo before. And here, the, the length of the piglet was measured to about 0.56 meter, so about half a meter. So if there's less space from the otter to the ball, then, then it, this could be considered um, as, as too little for the piglet to be able to lie, um, lie during suckling without being able to, to move around to get space to themselves. Enrichment, this is the last point I have, is that the enrichment should also be provided in the farrowing pen like for all other categories of pigs according to the EU directive, uh, as is stated here above. And um, 
good materials that can be used is the same as for other categories of pigs, where straw, the straw is a, a good material that can be used if there's some solid floor. Also, sawdust can be used <coughs> in pens with a fully flat floor. Um, ropes is a suggestion. You can see that on the photo here. It could also be a, a dude sack or scrap paper. These things also work fine. And I will just give an example from a Finnish study here, where you can see they studied the effect of providing ropes to the suckling piglets in combination with shredded paper. And they looked into how much um, the pigs explored, uh, time they used on exploring these um, enrichment materials. You can see that on the, on the graph to the right. Showing they have um, either a ball or a ball and rope and paper. And you can see here how much they use the ball if they only have that. That is the control condition shown to the far left. And then how much they use the rope. They use the rope considerably more than the ball and even more with the shredded paper, which is to the right on the graph. So, so um, these things work fine and can be used in pens where it's more difficult to, to use materials like straw or similar. At the end here, I would also draw the attention to that uh, there's increasing evidence also that there are long-term effects of providing enrichment that go beyond just providing outlet for exploratory behavior. And I think these are interesting and encouraging to know about also. For example, we know that when they're provided with exploratory materials that are, are good, it elicits play behavior, which is indicative of positive welfare, and helps piglet develop uh, during, old, um, during their later life, and also uh, partly uh, prevent um, aggressive interaction instead. Um, it's also been shown that uh, providing good enrichment reduces food nephobia during the pre period and increases time spent in the feeding area. So you could imagine that uh, providing good enrichment encourages the, the curiosity of the piglets to, to forage on solid feed and therefore also that early feed intake would be um, facilitated by having some interesting um, um, enrichment material in the pen. It's also been shown in the Finnish study I showed before, they showed an, uh, a marked effect uh, on the tail biting later on after the winning of providing enrichment in the growing period or in the winning, in the pre-winning period. <coughs> and lately a, a very recent study also showed interesting effect uh, on improving long-term resilience by providing enrichment in the, in the pre-winning period as well, well as in the post-winning period. On, for example, one thing they measured was, um, was the hair cortisol, which is accumulating uh, cortisol stress responses. And here you can see that in, in the treatment, the conventional treatment, um, there was higher cortisol levels um, at eight weeks of age um, in the conventional, but not in the enriched treatment, which was the AIDS, um, AIDS treatment. So I think these are, are interesting also to keep in mind that there are benefits also beyond just what is happening in the pre-weaning period. So thank you. This was what I had today. <laughs>